Our topic for today is section 9.8, which is power series. So here's the definition. Power series looks like this. Sum of a and x to the n. x is a variable. That's what's in you with respect to first few sections in this chapter. Or it could be a n times x minus c to the n. So this one we say that it's centered at 0, and this one is centered at c. So what's happening here? Generally, x is undisclosed a number. So, for, so when we plug in x, because a n is just a sequence, then n is a natural number. So generally, when we keep plugging x, specific values of x, we'll get a series, numerical series from the first few sections. And for some values of x, it will converge. And for some, it will diverge. So our main goal today is determine for which value. Of x, does it converge? And here is the main theorem. Theorem says the following uh, suppose that zero is less than absolute value of d, less than an absolute value of d, and that sum a n d to the n and it goes you know, to infinity converges. Then sum of a n d to the n when n goes to zero to infinity also converges. Proof is fairly simple. It's a little exercise in what we have learned before. Sum n goes 0 to infinity, a n b to the n equals sum a n um, and there is a d to the n times d to the n, so which is divided and multiplied by d to the n, which is what? Sum n goes 0 to infinity, and we'll get what? a n d to the n, or times b over d to the n. And then what? Why does this converge? From the assumption that sum a n d to the n converges, you see, uh, I'm not saying absolutely converges for certainty, but the main thing is now a and d n according to the divergence test approaches zero. Because if you converge your individual members approach zero, so that means after a while a and d n is by absolute value less than one. It gets very small, so for n greater than some k. And after that k, what will happen? Then we'll have the following, that absolute value of a and d to the n times b over d to the n is less than or equal, less than 1, then, then it's even less than, so this is less than 1, less than b over d to the n. That's what we have. This series converges. Why? Because this is just geometric series. Geometric series. So it converges. Uh, uh, absolute value b over d is less than 1. So it converges. And then what? Since uh, uh, our absolute value is less than the absolute values of the convergence series, and then actually what? Sum of a n b to the n absolute value of that n goes zero to infinity converges. So our series only converges and it converges absolutely. So basically what we could have used here uh, absolute value. But doesn't matter. Anyway, so um, 
Uh, why is this so important? Because this is actually uh, giving us the main thing about the geometry of those points where we can let me raise the proof. And we will just take so the following. So here first, obviously it's all about absolute value. So so it happens here in the following. It, it, let, let, let's say zero is here. Then if you determine that convergence here at the point. There might be no other point because if you put zero, it converges obviously because everybody is zero. So if at zero, everybody converges. So that's no brainer. If I determine that I converge here, then what will happen? So let's say I converge at three. Then, according to this theorem, it will converge everywhere else between zero and three. And not only there, but all the way to negative three, because for all those points, it is uh, correct. So I, I don't know at negative three itself, because this says if absolute value is less than yours. And then what? Is that uh, the total of converging points? No, because it might be now that I'll get more and more. But the generally, what happens? Once I have a convergence, then everything in that interval is convergent. So that's why the points or back of where some a n x to the n converges constitute an interval. So here is the only ambiguity. So generally, at the end, if you take supremum of all the values um, where it converges, if that supremum exists, if, 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 if supremum exists, let's say that's R, then you know that you also converge between negative R. And here is what we call interval of convergence. Interval. So if the supremum of all the converging points is R, then all the way to the R, because of this theorem, we will establish the convergence of the same thing as negative R. And then what is the dilemma? What happens at R itself and negative R? You cannot uh, determine that in a universal way. Sometimes both of them, uh, uh, it converges at both of them. Sometimes one of them, some of them none, and that's the case. Of course, there are special cases when this R is, has some special value. So what if supremum does not exist? You keep going and converges all the time. So what R, R could be infinity. So that means then interval is negative infinity, <laughs> negative infinity to infinity, that means converges everywhere. So that could happen. Or it could happen the other extreme that R is only zero. So the only place where you converge is a zero itself. And whatever you, you, you cannot establish your basis for sweeping to the left or to the right. So that could happen. Or as I said, R is non zero. In that case, that's exactly what we said here. Then you have negative R here, you have R here and you will have convergence in that interval. And then here, we don't know yet, we need to do specific analysis. So the question is, of course, how do we determine this R? And we'll actually show you this uh, in the, uh, we'll just use, use the ratio test. So to get R, let's say that, to get R, you use the ratio test. And basically, we are done with this section. So this is just application of what we learned before. I'll let you how it works from one problem to another. It's not very dramatically complicated here. More like exercise and ratio test for the plate of alchemical moments. Of course, all my discussion was about power series centered at zero. 
What if it's centered that C? The whole story is centered around C, as we will see from some examples. So here it is, problem 16. So it determined the interval of convergence for some and go zero to infinity three x to the n over two n factorial. So what are we gonna do? We'll just uh, use use the ratio test as a solution. Ratio test. So we want what? That absolute value of a n plus one over a n in limit across infinity is less than one. So let's carefully calculate this. Uh, as we did before, uh, we will put n plus first number normally the way it is, and then take a reciprocal of a n. So we get the following. 3x is 3x. n becomes n plus 1. Here carefully, 2 times n plus 1 factorial. Here it is. And their absolute value, don't forget it, times, we take a reciprocal. So we get 2n factorial, and we get 3x to the n. And we want this to be less than 1. And then when we solve for it, we'll actually get our R. Uh, so what happens with our algebra? We have power n plus 1, power n. They cancel out. There's only one left. Let's handle factorials carefully. 3x times 2n factorial. This is 2n plus 2, so stems 2n plus 2. Then there is 2n plus 1, and then there is 2n factorial. and factorials cancel each other out. So what happens here? I don't need to copy it. It's quite clear. How much is this limit? So be careful. You can say, but we don't know what x is. No matter what x is, this x is fixed. Might be 10, 50, 70, million. So this is a fixed constant. And this goes to infinity. So no matter what you commit yourself uh, for the value of x, this is divided by something that's huge, so this limit is zero. No matter which x you pick, this zero is less than one, so we get convergence. For which x is? For all x's. So what we got here is actually we got this case. That interval of convergence, so the, the answer is the interval, negative infinity, Nothing much. All right, let's see the next member. Here's something more interesting. Problem number 26. It says sum and go zero to infinity, negative one to the n. 1 plus 1 over 2 plus 1. Again, find the interval of convergence. So what are we going to do? We'll just do the same thing as before. We'll set up the ratio test and see what happens. So we're going to limit. When n goes to infinity, absolute value. Because it's absolute value, I can disregard the counter. So, so here it is. Be careful here. Instead of n, I'll put n plus 1. So 2 times, and don't forget those parentheses plus 1. On top, I get x to the 2 times n plus 1 plus 1. That's my n plus 1. For a n, I'll just use the same thing that I have up there, just a little bit, because we are dividing. I hope by now we are comfortable with this. A limit, so I calculate that limit. Of course, that limit will be a function of x, supposedly. So that will tell you what are the, the uh, available values for x that would provide convergence. So that would be x to 2n plus 3 plus times 2n plus 
plus one. I flip these two guys using commutative laws and put x to the 2n plus 1 times 2n plus 3. How about some parentheses here? All right, this cancels out. There are two, uh, two copies extra on top, so I cancel all this, and I cancel this, and I get x squared. And here it is. I can split the limit with a question mark. If they both exist, splitting is fine. So I get limit. When n goes to infinity, it will be x squared. Hold on, actually x squared doesn't have ends, so I don't even need to split it. I just put it out. So 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 3. And then I don't have question mark. Absolute value. And what would that be? I'll pull out x squared. And then what is this limit? This limit is easy to calculate. I hope you don't use log tell me you just divide 2 plus 1 over n over 2 plus 3 over n. I lost my absolute value sign because they are positive, so there was no need. So obviously, when this goes to 0, this goes to 0, you get 2 over 2, which is 1. So my limit is x squared. So what we were able to do is to uniformly analyze all these uh, numerical series simultaneously. And we said the following. No matter which x you use, a ratio test will give x squared. And then we recall, wait, 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 but that should be less than 1. So that gives you your interval of convergence. So x squared has to be less than 1. And that means if you square root, but keep in mind negatives, x is between 1 and a negative 1. So we are almost there. Actually, what happened is this. So we are getting this case now. And the only thing left, and that's what uh, this um, machinery cannot tell you, is what happens when x at, at the ends. x equals negative 1 and x equals 1. So x equals negative 1. What do we get? Then we use our uh, previous sections. Infinity, negative 1 to the n, negative 1 to the 2n plus 1, over 2n plus 1. Negative 1 to the 2n plus 1 is negative 1. Why? Because it's an odd power. So I can, so it will be what? Sum n goes 0 to infinity, negative 1 to the n plus 1. Because this is just equal to 1 minus 1. So those n, and that 1 is n plus 1, over 2n plus 1. And now we have to decide, that will this converge or diverge? So this is alternating series, so section would be 9, 6, and here. And then what happens? It's alternating series. 1 over 2n plus 1 monotonically approaches 0. So uh, according to the alternating series, test converges. Alternating series test. All right, what happens at x equals 1? Let me try to squeeze that in. I'll get the same calculation. But at x equals 1, what will happen? Actually, uh, where would that be? Where's my? So when x equals 1, then this uh, negative 1 was to the 2n plus 1, now 1 to the 2n plus 1. So it just gets an extra, uh, it doesn't give that extra minus, but the story is the same. So we get sum and go 0 to infinity minus 1 to the n over 2n plus 1. So what happens here? The same thing. Converges because it's again alternating. The, what is the only difference? Here there's an extra minus, so generally um, starts with a negative and then you get positives. Here it starts with positives and makes negatives, doesn't matter, it's alternating for the same reason converges. So finally, what's our answer? And I like to draw it always, and I suggest that you do the same. Our interval of convergence is negative 1 to 1, closed interval. So both endpoints uh, gave us convergence. So generally what it says, whatever you plug in between negative 1 and 1, including themselves, it will give you convergence. If you plug anything outside there, that will not give you the convergence. And that's how, how this testing works. It's all almost the same. All right. Uh, another one just to see one example where, it, where your series is not centered at zero. So what we'll then do, the whole thing, the story will be shifted. So same reasoning, just 
and here and you will see how our inequality, so this will be sheet. A little bit, so here it is number 24, says analyze the sum, n goes 1 to infinity, negative 1 to the n plus 1, x minus 2 to the n, over 10 times 2 to the n. And then the same business, limit, when n goes to infinity, absolute value, disregard the counter, x minus 2 to the n plus 1, n plus 1 times 2 to the n plus 1 times n times 2 to the n or x minus 2 to the n. Now heavy cancellation, be careful just n plus 1 copy, n copy, so n are gone, just 1 is left. The same thing here, n are gone, just 1 is left. So we have basically the following. It's a limit when n goes to infinity. I can, absolute value can split, set for the absolute value of x minus 2 times, I don't need absolute value on n because they are positive, uh, n over 2 times n plus 1. x minus 2 is here, n is here, t plus 1 is here, and 2 is there. So what would then be absolute value of x minus 2 can go in front of the limit because there are no n's there. So limit when n goes to infinity, we divide by n here, so we get 1 over 2 times 1 plus 1 over n. Basically what I did is I just divided by n to them and executed separation. Obviously this limit is what this goes to 0, so it's 1 half. So it's 1 half absolute value of x minus 2. So we calculated simultaneously all these limits for ratio test. And we know that if you go on convergent, this has to be less than 1. So what happens here, we get rid of 2, and we get absolute value of x minus 2 is less than 2. What does that mean? How do you open absolute value? x minus 2 must be between 2 and a negative 2. Look at the same as before, but now when we add 2 to, both, to all three expressions, our symmetry shifts to the right. So we get 0. Or equal x, but the only difference happens at that last moment. So it's not symmetric interval anymore. So here's our interval. So here is 0, here is 4, and we have convergence everywhere in between. And as usually, the question is what happens when x is 0 and when x is 4. So when x is 0, what will happen? Will we have some? n goes 1 to infinity, now counter is important. What would that be? 0 minus 2 is negative 2 to the n over n times 2 to the n. Now careful with your algebra, what would that be? Minus 1 to the n plus 1 times negative 1 to the n times 2 to the n. So I thought of negative 2 as negative 1 times 2, and then I split it. Over n times 2 to the n. Why did I do that? So that these guys can uh, communicate and cancel, and also these minuses can combine. So what do I get? Negative 1 to the 2n plus 1. 2n plus 1 is odd, so negative 1 to the 2n plus 1 is pure negative 1. So there's no alternation anymore. This is the sum, and then it goes 1 to infinity, negative 1 over n. And what happens here? Converges. Why? Because it's alternating, 1 over n monotonically goes to 0, so um, it's converges according to an alternating series. What happens at, at, at x equals 4? Then it looks similar, but I'm sorry, this was absolute nonsense. Sorry, this diverges. So now it so diverges. Why? Because this is not alternating, this is pure minus 1. So basically, when I factor out minus 1, I 
I get sum 1 over n when n goes 1 to infinity. So this is basically harmonic series multiplied by negative 1, 3, 9, which is sorry for this. And now the counter will survive. So we will get what? Uh, we'll get 2 to the n. Because now what? When you plug in x equals 4, we get 4 minus 2, which is 2 to the n, over n times 2 to the n. So now when you cancel, you have counter that alternates. So you see, here we didn't have power minus 1, we just minus 1 all the time. So all the members are negative. So that diverges. Here, counter survive. So we have alternative series test. 1 over n monotonically goes to 0. So it converges. So what's our final answer? On the left side, it still di uh, diverges. But on the right side, it converges. And I told you, it could be all cases could happen. Diverges on both ends. Converges on both ends, or converges on one, diverges on the other. But as I said, machinery is almost the same all the time. All right, so uh, here's another problem. So besides this almost mechanical part, we can do a little analysis that can help us prepare from the section that are coming. So what would that be? Maybe it's more than this. Let's look at the problem number 45. Let's look at the section number 45. Let's look at the series f of x equals sum x over 2 to the n when n goes 0 to so what happens with this series? It's fairly easy to see that interval of convergence is what? This is generally a geometric series. So the interval of convergence is between negative 2 and 2. Endpoints both fail because, you remember, for geometric series, just it will fail divergence test. But here is something that's very important for manipulation of, of those series within interval of convergence. Of course, outside of interval of convergence, this doesn't make sense. But imagine for all x is between negative 2 and 2, there is a sum. So you add it up, you get a sum, you add it up, you get So basically, you have a function f of x for all uh, that has as a value those infinite sums, and that function exists on this interval. So this is the domain of So for every x between negative 2 and 2, I just run this series, add it up, take a limit of partial sums, I get a value. And when I line up all these values, I have a function, and that function has, um, has, uh, uh, has values, and as I said, those values are between negative 2 and 2. So there are some values here, and there are some values here. So this is a function between negative 2 and 2. All right. So the question is, uh, for example, standard things that we do in calculus. Can I differentiate this function? So it's a question now. Can I differentiate this function just member by member? There is a long story. So this really needs a little more analysis, a little proof, but just trust us that this is what will happen. So generally what happens here, uh, we'll get a series where we just differentiate x half to the n. So we get n times x half to the n minus 1 and times 1 half to the n for the j. And then n will go from 1 to infinity y because at n equals 0, uh, we just get, uh, uh, it, it was a constant, so that guy disappeared. Then second derivative would now go from 2 to infinity, and then we would get n times n minus 1 over another 2 for the chain rule, so it will be 2 squared x half to the n minus 2. So, so what happens? Their, their interval of convergence 
is the same as the interval of convergence of your original function. So generally, this is very important property of power series that you can differentiate them and integrate them within interval of convergence. So what was the integral of f of m? They keep existing on that interval of convergence. So what would be integral of f of x dx? As I said, that it is. So if you formally do it, that would be integral from 0 to infinity. And what would that be? Uh, let's say, I will, I will think of it as x to the n over 2 to the n. So it would be x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 to the n. But of course, there is plus c here as ambiguity exists when we integrate it. There is that um, ambiguity by a constant. So generally, when you look at this one, it also has interval of convergence negative 2 to 2. So what we just concluded from this little example, if you take a power series and you differentiate or integrate within interval of convergence, then the series that you obtain also converge on that interval. So we use that property. In, in next problem 64, which is a very interesting problem, really it has a little different flavor than those just plug-in problems. So let's look at this, and this will reappear in the coming section. Let's look at the following function. f of x equals sum n goes 0 to infinity x to the n over x factorial. So what is it? Um, what is this? This is a power series. Question A. Find the interval of convergence. And if we repeat what we just learned uh, a minute ago, it will be easy to see, easy to see if we run our machinery to see that it converges everywhere between negative and Then what? Uh, let's see what is first derivative of x. So what we are trying is to kind of uh, find out what is this function really. So which function is this? So what we are doing is the following. So we saw interval of convergence. So this function exists on negative infinity. So that's the only number. Let's differentiate f member by member, as we agreed a minute ago, though without proof, that that's valid. So how much is f prime of x? So you skip the sum, and that's the trickiest part. I wonder if you want of this. So that would be x to the n over n factorial prime. What would that be? You pull out 1 over n factorial. The derivative of x to the n is n times x to the n minus 1. Then, you remember, I can write n as n times n minus 1 factorial. Now you cancel n and n. And looks how interesting it is. Looks almost the same. Although, what did I forget here? You cannot go from 0 to 1. But then what? I, I told you that in one of the examples, this is like substitution. Generally, if you want to re rearrange the index, if I want the index to start from zero, then we lower, it's a substitution, lower the indexes and raise the variable. So that's the same as m goes zero to infinity. I lower them by one. Now n to the minus one will become x to the n. If you want to test if you did it correctly, let's say when n equals 1, what do I get? x to the 0 over 0 factorial here, x to the 0 over 0 factorial. By the way, I never mentioned what is 0 factorial. 0 factorial by convention is 1. And what is the reason for that? So for, for reason for that is 3 factorial is 3 times 2 times 1, which is 3 times 2 factorial then 2 factorial is 2 times 1 factorial. 1 factorial, by analogy, is 1 times 0 factorial. Since this is 1 and this is 1, so 1 over 1 equals 0. That's why 0 factorial 
mathematicians decided to make it one. Although combinatorially also, if you want to think about it, what is three factorial? Three persons around the table. In how many ways can you shuffle that? And that's six ways. And then what? If there is nobody at the table, in how many ways can you assemble them? In one way, just keep the table empty. So that's number of configurations also agrees with that notation. Anyway, uh, we, we kind of justify this. And surprisingly, we got that f prime of x equals f of x. So this function, a mysterious function, let's call it, is equal to its derivative. Let me calculate how much is f of 0. F of zero is basically what? Sum n goes zero to infinity. Uh, I, I better write it more explicitly. F of x is what? Uh, x to the zero, which is one over uh, zero factorial. One over zero factorial plus uh, one over one factorial x plus one over two factorial x squared and so on. So f of 0, all these members become 0. So f of 0 is 1. And here is a very interesting way. Actually, we can recover what, what is this function f of x. How? We say the following. We know that f prime of x equals f of x. Now, we are basically solving a very simple differential equation. We get it on the same side and we integrate. So f prime of x equals to 1. We integrate both sides with respect to x, of course. So what is this? Integral of f prime, prime by x, if you do substitution, this is du over u. So this is ln of absolute value of f. Equals integral of dx is just x plus. Then solving this ln equation, raising both sides to e, I'll write it here, e to the ln absolute value of f of x equals e to the x plus c. Here is a little machinery that we use in our differential equations course. We have absolute value of f of x is e to the c times e to the x. But e to the c is just a constant. So, uh, so we'll say what absolute value of x, this constant, I can call it the d times e to the x. So from here, f of x equals plus or minus d e to the x. More precisely, e to the c was positive constant, because e to the c is always positive. So with this plus or minus, it just says arbitrary constant. So I get f of x is d e to the x, where d is a constant which I don't know what it is. So generally what it says is, if you want to be sum of these series, you must be exponential function times some constant d. But then we use this fact that f of 0 is 1. So when you plug in x equals 0, we get f of 0, which is 1, equals d e to the 0. So what happens here? We get 1 equals d. So generally now we know that this function f of x equals d. So we kind of analyze the sum according to its properties. So it's a very interesting way. It's not like we calculated the sum. It's like a uh, looping method. So we said, all right, what happens if we differentiate that function? What stays the same? Do we know too many functions that stay the same when we differentiate? We actually showed that the only function that has that property is a multiple of e to the x. But then knowing specific value at 0 to be 1, we knew that uh, that multiple of e to the x is pure e to the x. And here is one very important formula. So this formula we'll be using for the rest of the chapter. That's one of the most important formula in this chapter. So it says, basically, that e to the x could be represented by the power series sum of x to the n over n factorial.